Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. Dr. Graves has asked me to talk to you this afternoon about the epidemiology of dental caries, with particular emphasis on the role of nutrition in the caries process. <clears throat> Now, of course, epidemiology of any disease is conditioned by the facts, the very nature of the disease process itself. <clears throat> and we all know a priori that dental caries is basically a disease which results from bacterial action. The prime cause, the prime etiology of dental caries is bacteriology and its, its action in the mouth. But up to now, it has been <clears throat> impossible to use what we know about microbiology and the epidemiology of this disease, a statement which probably dates this lecture as well as anything that might be said, because in all probability, next week or next year, this statement will be horribly out of date. But up to now, it has been necessary to approach the epidemiology of this disease as though it were a disease of unknown etiology. And this has placed some quite important constraints on what we may do with validity, what we may do practically in the study of this disease in people. Because, as I must remind you, epidemiology is the study of disease in people, not in laboratory animals, not on an agar plate, but in people where and how they live. And under these circumstances, approaching this disease as though it were a disease of unknown etiology, we have had two broad avenues of approach. The first and most common, at least up to recent times, has been what might be called the determination of relative risk. Relative risk. Who are the people most apt to incur this disease? Or perhaps who are the people most apt to avoid this disease, or perhaps if they incur it at all, to experience it in relatively mild fashion. Hence, the first thing emerges which must be kept in mind, and this is true of epidemiology generally. The determination of relative risk is not so much a study of disease per se as a study of the people in whom disease occurs, their ways of life, airs, waters, winds, to quote winters. And the objective is not so much to determine etiology of disease as to find by serendipity, perhaps, methods of controlling the disease. And historically, it is, remains true that about the only effective means of controlling a disease of unknown etiology has been had by the epidemiological approach. I might give you a number of instances here, but I imagine you're familiar with them. Snow on cholera, Panama on measles, typhoid in Hamburg, and so forth and so forth. But these are all part of your reading assignment. And knowing students, I am certain that each of you has memorized each of the reading assignments you've had up to this point. Your reading assignment also has at least alluded to the deductive nature of the logic of the study which focuses on relative risk. And I think you're quite aware of the fact that in such a situation, when we go out and see that which we expect to find, we may not be making very much money. For example, if we go out with the idea, as Marshall Day once did, that dental caries is at least mediated by a failure of calcium metabolism, 
And we set up the conditional syllogism on the basis of if calcium metabolism is important in dental caries, then women suffering from osteomalacia should exhibit rampant dental caries, which is pretty much the way Marshall Day stated the proposition he intended to test. And he went out in India and examined young women who were suffering from osteomalacia, a metabolic block for calcium. Well, how much further would he have been ahead had he found that there actually was rampant dental caries in these young women suffering from this calcium block? What he actually found was that in 100 young women with ages up to about 29, there was an average of 29 teeth with evidence of caries. And logically, and this is the seat of the pants kind of logic that Aristotle first uh, set up. Logically then, something was wrong with the original statement. Under those circumstances, it was quite impossible that osteomalacia should have an effect on the caries process unless perhaps it could be to inhibit caries, which is always the other way around. And this brings us to a sticky point it used to be, at least with some editors, namely that in this kind of study, the negative result is the re result that counts. And consequently, epidemiology in the definition of relative risk, and this is just as true of typhoid as it is of dental caries, is most valuable when it sweeps away the rubbish, when it destroys the concept that is not true. And it's very difficult today, of course, to, to find anyone who believes that osteomalacia is truly a factor in dental caries. Let's suppose again that Marshall Day had actually found rampant caries in this sample of young women who were suffering from osteomalacia he would have been in exactly the same position that I might have been or you might have been in had uh, we studied dental caries in Ethiopia and compared this Ethiopian group with a group living in Oslo in Norway. We would find a, an impressive difference in dental caries experience. But if we assumed that this was due to the wearing of shoes on the one hand and going barefoot on the other, we would have been committing the same error that Marshall Day might have made, except that Marshall Day was no idiot, might have made had he found rampant caries and said, this is due to the metabolic block we're studying. But suppose Marshall Day is of this world and uh, a whole series of followers had gone out and found rampant caries in every group suffering from osteomalacia. This would have established a relationship and it might even have established a predictable and dependent relationship. But this would not in and of itself have been enough to show that this relationship was one of cause and effect. One of the best worldwide correlations we can find with dental caries is the number of dentists per capita. Do dentists cause dental caries? Well, I rather hope not. Although, of course, the, uh, the reverse may be true, that the prevalence of dental caries does lead to a great deal more <sighs> dental practitioners and you would find in an area where dental disease is absent. I'm dreaming, I've never found such a place. These, this, of course, applies across the board. This is just as true of the epidemiology of typhoid as it is of the epidemiology of caries. But there are differences that you must keep in mind, I hope you will be able to, as you go through your studies of general epidemiology in your other classes. In most of these studies of communicable disease, 
case finding is all in all. I once reviewed a research application in which a young man with ambition was going to contrast two cities of about 30,000 people each, and he was going to try to find out which had the greatest incidence of acute childhood lymphatic leukemia, and to try and find out what went along with that thing. In other words, what was the risk? And it didn't get very far because given populations of 30,000 each, the odds are strong that this man would go his whole year without finding a single case of leukemia. This is a rare occurrence. And in that situation, case finding is all in all, and missing the one case that might turn the scales might destroy your study. But here we are dealing with a disease which affects very nearly everybody. Very nearly everybody. I'll have occasion later to say a little bit more about our findings in Ethiopia, where there was an average of something less than one decayed missing or filled permanent tooth per person in ages up through 39 years of age as close as we have ever seen to the absence of dental caries in a large population. Nonetheless, caries had affected one person in four in that population. Well, 22%, which is as near as matters. If that were smallpox, if that were anterior poliomyelitis, if that were even Asian flu, we would be talking about an epidemic and we'd all be running for the storm cellars. So that even at its lowest levels of prevalence, dental caries affects very nearly everybody. And in this situation, it is almost accurate to say that we try not to find cases. We are not in the least concerned with a total inventory of persons with caries, of teeth with caries, of surfaces with caries. And this is a very good thing because there is no way, not any way at all, that we can compile a total inventory of carious lesions in the living person. The total inventory requires sectioning. It requires the most delicate kind of decalcification because dental carry starts at the molecular level. And very few parents that I have dealt with are willing to let me take a mandibular section of their children's jaws just to find out if caries may be starting in some of the proximals that we can't find either with Mirror and Explorer, <coughs> pardon, or with bite wings. So there is this submerged period where we can't find the lesion of caries, a fact that we simply must live with at this stage of the state of the art. There's nothing we can do about it. That's how it is. And uh, this leads to two things that must be remembered. One of these is the very fact of this dark subliminal period where the lesion has begun, but is still too small to be detected by clinical means. The other thing, in analyzing our data, we must remember that we are not talking about initiation of pathologic caries. We are talking about caries progression. We are talking about clinical caries. And this is one time where the television uh, ad people may be uh, more accurate than usual when they say, look, Ma, only had one cavity. We do not have, at this point, any way to determine the point of onset of dental caries in the living human. And this is a very considerable, a very considerable drawback. Now, as of now, at least, we have another difficulty. A difficulty which in my lifetime, not yours, you're lucky, led 
very intelligent men to come to the conclusion that it would be impossible to create an epidemiology of dental caries. Namely, as of now, we are not able, in large samples at least, to determine whether caries is active in my mouth or yours. There has been a long list of, a very long list, of caries activity tests proposed, tested, and unfortunately, none of these has proved practicable in the large-scale survey which we may carry out to determine the relative prevalence, the relative prevalence of this extremely universal disease. This may be changed. Harris Keene and his group at the Great Lakes Dental Research Center have been quite successful for example, in collecting strep mutans, streptococcus mutans, from living mouths and predicting that a lesion will occur here probably in the next eight months to a year. The only problem being it takes hours, days, to work up the single patient. It's necessary to make a culture, take a culture from each of the proximal surfaces in the mouth, from pits and fissures if they're not involved, and the various requirements for plating out this facultative anaerobe make it a long, tedious, and quite expensive process. You and I are accustomed to thinking in terms of two or three or four hundred persons in a study group. To do this, <clears throat> properly for two or three or four hundred persons, even given the facilities at Great Lakes, would mean essentially that all restorative care for men at the lakes would have to stop so that this thing could be done. We can hope this sort of painstaking beginning quite frequently leads to a valid shortcut. And if anybody can do it, I believe those men up at the lakes are capable of it. So we'll keep our fingers crossed and we'll hope. And I must say something about the importance of time, time, in dental caries analyses of this type. You and I, as public health people, are interested in the clinical lesion, that thing which destroys tooth enough that it requires restoration. The kind of lesion that we are concerned about is not reversible, will certainly and surely progress to a point where it can be demonstrated by any means you choose. In fact, I've seen some lesions in first molars I could probably get my elbow into. The thing goes on till there's no question. This is dental caries. This is a lesion. None of the guesswork, which, believe me, is involved sometimes in the interpretation of bite wing films. And if you really believe, you can read a set of bite rings the same way twice without a lot of drilling. Try it sometime and see. Beginners in our shop have, by and large, failed to agree with themselves in about 27% of their calls the first time through. Which leads me to the importance, of course, of comparison. We're going to use these things not as screening for treatment, not as an attempt to find out how much dental manpower is needed here, but simply to find out whether the people who live in Grand Rapids are more susceptible to dental caries than the people who live in East Lansing. It's as simple as that. And this brings me by what I'm sure is a roundabout route <clears throat> to a statement which epidemiologists frequently make but rarely explain. And that statement is this. The unit of study in this kind of epidemiological research is not the individual, but the population, which leads to the obvious question, but how can you talk about an, a population <clears throat> when all your data are based upon the examination of individual people, one person at a time? How does this differ from the ordinary oral examination, in this case, given in the dental office? 
and it differs in some important, in important respects, some of which, fortunately, are on our side, <coughs> which I may be <coughs> able to illustrate with the help of that first slide. Can you see this one? This is something that I stole quite a long time ago from a paper by Sandler and Stahl, which had to do with diagnosis as a means of setting up treatment plan for individuals affected with periodontal disease. And they asked this question, would a simple count of the number of teeth in the mouth, that is to say the percentage per man, percentage per person, percentage per minute, how do you pronounce it? Never doesn't matter. Of teeth in which gingival recession has come to the point of, a, of exposing cementum. Is this useful as a diagnostic measure in working up a treatment plan for the periodontal patient? So they did this thing for a thousand plus individuals and checked it out with a rather complex scoring system for bone resorption as detected on bite wing and full mouth x-ray films. And they came to the inescapable conclusion that in treatment planning, this is no bleeped good. And they're dead right. When you are planning treatment for the individual patients, you dare not assume such mistakes as uh, this one. Here is a person, or here is a group of something less than 10% of teeth showing gingival recession, but the ultimate score the ultimate loss of bone going along with it, or on the other side, and by the way, this ought to be 135. Here is an individual with no bone loss, but all of the teeth affected with gingival recession. You cannot make that kind of mistake when you are planning treatment for the individual patient. But suppose we had been interested in the group status and not in the status of any one of these individuals. <coughs> This regression line is their own. And as you can see, there is a very close, a very exact correspondence between the average score for gingival recession and the average score as produced by this elaborate, time-consuming, and expensive x-ray survey, which they were able to do. So had we been interested in the gingival status of any of these groups of people. The greatest mistake we would have made, assuming that the x-ray survey was exactly correct, which is probably wrong, would have been 11%. Now, in this situation, an error of no more than 11% is pure velvet. One of the problems in evaluating this sort of thing whether it's one of our diseases or one of theirs, is the problem of error. And I remind you that in analysis, from the statistical point of view, the error, the mistake error of mistakes in examination is not the only source of error that worries the man who jiggles the computer. He is probably, and certainly in dental care, he's more concerned about deviations of individual from the average, the error he's worried about. And in dental caries, as usually studied, individuals may vary all the way from zero to 28 decayed missing and filled permanent teeth. It's very difficult to find an examiner who can be that far off consistently day after day after day. And if you are just getting into statistics, uh, this probably is a very obscure statement. But remember, if you will, that error to the statistician is any deviation from the group average, whether it's induced by a mistake in examination, getting the wrong name on the examination paper, or more importantly, the true error, because that is due to the fact that people do not conform to averages. Perhaps this is as good a time as any to ask for a moment of silent prayer 
in memory of the man who drowned in the river that averaged six inches deep. Averages can, uh, you don't have to be a horse player to find out that averages can rise up and, and bite you. There are other difficulties that we run into. Of these, probably the most difficult is the irreversible nature of the things that we look at in dental caries. If you have a cavity in a tooth, it remains a cavity in a tooth. This means that because we must depend, as of now, on these things which cannot reverse themselves, the only way we can find out about caries activity in a given period of time is to examine at the beginning, at the end, and at the end of that period of time. In much the same fashion that you examine Johnny when he's six years old and examine him again at the age of seven to find out how many inches he has grown in that period. And this has cost us tremendously. <clears throat> we studied the youngsters at Grand Rapids for 17 years before we were positive that what we were saying was the straight, simple, absolute truth. Had there been some way to do this thing on a carries activity test in a few weeks, we would have saved a very great deal of money and a great deal of time. Half a generation of youngsters didn't get fluoridation of water supplies because of the time required for this and the concurrent tests. And I must point out simply in passing that the measures we have been accustomed to using, the decayed missing and filled tooth index, for example, were all developed for study of dental caries in children. And because of this, we have a very considerable gap in our knowledge of dental caries in adults. And I'm thinking of caries of the root surface, cemental caries. The index itself is not insensitive to this, they're properly used. But almost all of the examination forms that you will see, practically all of the computer programs that are in being, the software that's already been gotten together, ignores the possibility of dental caries in a root surface. And is still another complication to the difficulty that we run into when we try to count carious surfaces instead of carious teeth. All this is pretty much covered in detail in your reading assignments. I probably don't need to go further with this. Although, this is the sort of thing that can be studied for years. And having done that thing for years, I still feel a little bit insecure about the notion that I know all there is to know about Carey's indices. This can go on practically forever. So much then for now with this uh, approach to the determination of relative risk. Let me simply say in passing on from this that the important thing, the basic thing which we must have when we compare is comparability. So all of the dental caries methods and indices which have proved usable are those which are most apt to return comparable data between two examiners, between one examiner working over a long period of time, or what have you. I say most nearly. It is always hazardous to assume that two independent examiners have used the same criteria and have given you data which are truly comparable in dental caries. I said there were two approaches. The other approach, which is, I'm quite sure, familiar to you, to all of you, is the approach of the clinical trial. Now, this gets to be essential. Because of the truism that I mentioned earlier, 
namely that establishment of a relationship between phenomenon A and phenomenon B does not prove at all that A is the cause of B, or even conversely, that B is the cause of A. There is only one valid way to establish cause and effect, and that is to conduct what amounts philosophically to a bench experiment, a bench experiment, the inductive type of reasoning. Every time I have held, started to say a nickel, that won't work. Every time I've held a dollar, silver dollar, I'm in trouble, a quarter, and have opened my hand, it's fallen to the floor. This happens time and time and time again, and I begin to believe that every time I let a quarter drop, it will fall to the floor. If I go out and examine children in area after area after area where fluoride is in the water and I find an inhibition of dental caries, I begin to believe that fluoride is the reason for that inhibition. But I have no right to consider this established until I do the final thing, namely to fluoridate a water and observe the same result that I have seen in areas where fluoride occurs naturally. Now, there are probably as many pitfalls in the clinical trial of whatever agent, but particularly possibly in the trial of a dental caries inhibitory agent than there is in the procedure which leads to a pretty firm notion of relative risk. We have had some 50 years of hard and brutal, let me say, experience with attempts to try with human beings the effects of something which hopefully would prove to be efficacious. with the result that there has been developed what amounts almost to the Kabuki theater approach to the clinical trial. Rather facetiously, I suggested earlier that you might, with some profit, memorize these readings you were assigned. In all seriousness, I hope you will come very close to memorizing at least becoming familiar with each phrase in a statement which originally appeared under the title Principal Requirements for Controlled Clinical Trials. The original document is found in the International Dental Journal, volume 17, pages 93 through 103 for March 1967. This statement was the result of hard work by four men working under the auspices of the FDI. I'll try it, Federación Dantera Internacional. With the assistance of a considerable body of consultants as to what were these requirements for a valid trial of a dental caries inhibitor. This, I think, is as good a statement of philosophy as there is in the literature. This plus the very small, not too important, modifications which were made two years, four years later in a meeting at Mexico City. This has been followed up by the results of a conference, two conferences, convened by the American Dental Association, one in 1954, one a little bit later. And I like to think of these two statements as complementary. The FDI statement as a statement of principle, the ADA document as a cookbook listing, checklist, what have you, of logistics, what the instruments you need and this and this and this and this. 
The point being, really, that hard and in some cases embarrassing experience has led to the establishment of these guidelines as minimum requirements. The original title for this thing that the FDI put out was not principal requirements, but minimum requirements. I hope you'll read it. You're familiar if you simply read the literature with a great many of these things, the necessity for adequate samples, which in youngsters 11 through 13 years of age, the age group they deal with, involves generally three or 400 children per study group. For adequate duration of the trial, which in the original statement meant three years as a minimum, and that was later modified to two years, Adequate examination, random assignment of people to study and control groups, a single variable, all the things that you're familiar with. You may never run a clinical trial. In fact, if I disliked you, I might wish that particular fate for you because there is nothing more frustrating than trying to keep three or four or five or six or eight hundred children in line for two or three years to be sure that the ones who get Agent A get it and the ones who are not supposed to get it don't get it and all this and this and this. And uh, some of these studies that involve things like furnishing families sugar-coated cereals and whatnot must surely have driven some of the people into the padded cell. But nonetheless, when you read with this thing in the back of your minds, I think you will be able to pick out the valid study from the one which has taken much too much for granted. And with this in mind, and with Dr. Graves' request in mind, namely the emphasis on nutrition, you may be horrified to learn, if you don't know it already, that the principal clinical trial on which we base our faith in the nutritional prevention of dental caries, on what used to be called protective foods, vitamin D, what the brilliant woman who carried this study out called calcifying vitamin and mineral, was carried out with how many children? Anybody wants to guess? Well, her largest group was her control group. She had 13 children in it. How long did it go on? <coughs> Eight months. What was the method of examination? Unknown. How many variables were involved? Also unknown. Because her belief was that in adding vitamin D, that is to say cod liver oil, to one of the groups of children, this group, by the way, had nine children in it, she was boosting their calorific intake up to such a high point that it was necessary to withdraw sugars and other carbohydrates from that group and so on and so on and so on. This particular trial would be laughed out of any court at all today, and yet this is the thing which is quoted as proof that cod liver oil or milk or these protective foods will somehow inhibit dental caries. Dr. Phil Jay here formally in this school put out a booklet on dietary management which makes the statement that most mothers know that the feeding of their children of milk and vegetables and what have you will not inhibit dental caries. This is one of the reasons why we sometimes seem to be stupid, religionists when we talk to the pragmatic people who are the parents in this day and age. No, too many variables, too short a time. Differences which were inconsequential. 
and whatnot. And this brilliant woman, and she was brilliant, let me make this very plain. We should not blame this outstanding researcher for not knowing 50 years ago what we've learned in the interim. Nobody knew how to do a clinical trial. In fact, she was practically a pioneer. There was something not quite civilized in trying this thing out on people back in those days. The laboratory was supreme. This was pure truth. And if it happened not to work on people, why more unpower to the people themselves. As I say, we could talk a long time on these things. You're probably getting bored. Let me give you a couple of final thoughts here, which is partly repetitive, of course, before I ask for the questions that this probably has stimulated. Ethically, I'm sorry, historically, the epidemiological approach to relative risk is the only approach that's paid off with disease of unknown etiology. And this goes way back to the people, I've seen them in Guatemala, probably some of you have seen them elsewhere, people who live up above the frost line but go down every day to take care of their crops in the lowland because they know if they live down there, they'll die of malaria, and it's right. Now this didn't call for any knowledge of the etiology of malaria, but it worked. And time and again in history, with the use of common sense and observation, people have learned to control disease. The other thing about the relative risk method is this, and I haven't even touched on this point. We dare not inflict a dangerous or inimical agent on a population of human beings. The only way we can study such a thing in humans is, first of all, to detect it where and as they live and then do what we can to remove it from their environment. So if the agent is potentially dangerous, we dare not inflict it on humans in any trial or clinical trial situation. The clinical trial obviously requires rigorous preparation, meticulous carrying out and whatnot, but even so, because this is an area where not all the variables are necessarily known or necessarily hedged by randomization, it is still necessary that the one clinical trial be corroborated by a second and still a third. That is the minimum the Food and Drug Administration requires. We have a great deal of rubbish in dental literature which stems directly from some of the fallacies I've been trying to touch on, perhaps too lightly. Somebody goes out and finds this associated with caries, either a great deal or, or little, and comes up with the idea that people who are suffering from pulmonary tuberculosis have exacerbated dental caries, which is wrong. Or we have a single clinical trial and this is particularly apt to be fallacious when the father of the idea carries out the trial, which says that agent A is terrifically effective in inhibiting carriers or something else, and then nobody else can corroborate this finding. So here we stand, and I know, as I say, that some of the things I've said have been outrageous. I hope so. So I'll ask you to throw your outrage at me in whatever question has been stimulated. I'd rather you'd come one at a time. <laughs> Is anybody awake? <laughs> Uh, Dr. Russell, you mentioned that caries can't be halted once it starts and then it continues on. It's irreversible. What about Arnhem's slide that he shows of his preventive case, the woman that he took for 20 years? Is this not factual? What has happened in this particular instance? Well, this is a fallacy, and of course I've got to touch on this a little bit later, possibly. This is a fallacy of the case... Uh, history method of reporting. 
<coughs> I have such a lesion in my own mouth. It's been there, I don't know, since worry before World War II. And this happens sometimes. Caries becomes arrested, particularly in a fluoride area. And I was practicing in a fluoride area before that. And it's a, another example of uh, the fact that somehow the wearing of shoes in, induces dental caries. Now, this is not to impute dishonesty to people of this type. If you have ever read the uh, old oral surgery, the three O's, journals of that sort, a man has found himself successful in this particular line of treatment or what have you. And uh, he illustrates his success with a series, say, of six case histories, which have been taken out of, say, 500. Why? Because these illustrate the point that he's trying to make. Now, if he's already convinced himself that this is a truism, he is going to pick out these things that worked. If you will give me uh, the right to pick and choose the evidence I'll present, I can prove anything. And this, by the way, is the basis of Walbot's arguments about, uh, and we'll get into this at a later time, Walbot's arguments about uh, people who are sensitive to fluoride in water. Pick out the ones, pure chance says this will happen once in a while, these two things will happen together. And uh, forget the ones where it didn't happen, didn't fit your particular concept. For today, we looked rather briefly at some of the principles, some of the philosophy involved in the epidemiological study of disease generally and of dental caries in particular. And I propose during this hour to look at some of the population findings resulting from epidemiological study and remembering its objectives, looking at it from the standpoint, looking at these patterns, from the standpoint of what we might do to control this disease, dental caries. And if I seem to you to be somewhat tongue-tied, it will be because of the prohibition Dr. Graves put me under when he gave me this assignment, namely that I wait to talk about fluoride and dental caries to some later session. I can't pass over this point without noting the profound effect that adequate fluoride ingestion at the proper time has upon the mechanism of dental caries in a population. This always works, always works. And another population finding, which will certainly not be in dispute, is the fact that the onset of this disease in susceptible people comes at a very early age, following very shortly after the eruption of the first teeth. This is not a matter of conjecture or question, questioning. We know that. We all know it. Anyone who has had anything at all to do with dental care anywhere, anytime, has been most horribly impressed, and I think the word horror is properly used here, at the early age in which dental caries can attack this poor little youngster who is not yet able to go to school or read or do any of the things that we think of as means of his education. Not so clear, at least in times past, is the idea that dental caries prevalence actually varies tremendously from place to place in the world. And this quite independently, by the way, of a fluoride ingestion. If we may have the first slide, and going generally to the literature of dental caries, we find agreement that caries prevalence is relatively high in most populations of North and South America and in Western Europe. It is appallingly high in New Zealand, Australia, Tahiti, Tahiti perhaps in particular, Hawaii, in urban Eskimos, in Trinidad, 
Prevalence is intermediate in fluoride areas in the United States and in the Southern Hemisphere for certain, Ecuador, Bolivia, probably others. In the Near East, Greece, Israel, Lebanon, Egypt, the Far East in Malaya and Indonesia. Relatively low in Ethiopia, Burma, Thailand, Vietnam, India, China, Thailand, Taiwan, remote areas of Alaska, in Jordan, and in New Guinea. This from the literature, in part at least, and shown you in this non-numeric fashion because of the difficulties that I have at least alluded to in comparing data on dental caries from two examiners who have not been standardized one against the other. This matter of standardization is the essential value, or shows the essential value of the material in the next slide, where we have an array of findings for mean, decayed, missing, and filled permanent teeth in civilian groups aged 20 through 24 years, starting with Ethiopia and ending with Aleuts in Alaska. Now, the peculiar value of this array is this. All of these data were gotten together by my own research group at NIDR, the National Institute of Dental Research, and most of these examinations were actually made by me. So these are true differences. These are not statistical artifacts due to inability of two examiners really to agree on what goes on here. We like this age group, 20 through 24 years, for the study of dental caries. These people are old enough that slight differences in the time of eruption in teeth are very tiny. They've had very little effect on time at risk of the teeth. They're young enough that relatively few teeth have been lost to causes other than dental caries, a thing which can be a problem later in life. So here we found, we find at this age, civilian young men and women in Ethiopia with, as I mentioned earlier, fewer than one tooth per person affect by caries on the average. Through the hill tribes of Vietnam who are not Vietnamese ethically, Burma, Thailand, coming down to where we find our first United States population in Colorado Springs, and I mustn't tell you why their dental caries experience is as low. Going on through urban Eskimos in Alaska, white individuals in Baltimore, a group studied by us for another purpose in 1954, which by the sheerest chance, the mere, sheerest good chance, turns out to be almost exactly equivalent to the data found in a national survey of U.S. citizens, an area probability sample of the entire United States carried out a little more than 10 years ago. Now, if you know anything at all about international nutrition, and we're getting into nutrition now, a few minutes look, a study of this array of findings must make you question the idea that the better nourished the population, the least its experience with dental caries. In Ethiopia, our team found widespread protein malnutrition. And the protein that was had was largely cereal, deficient in some of the amino acids necessary for good nutrition. Calories, by and large, were inadequate. Ethiopians, by and large, were deficient in vitamin D. Remember protective foods? Vitamin D was deficient in Ethiopia and in a rather random array of the other populations seen here. They were deficient in ascorbic acid. In fact, they were high, adequate, only in one nutrient, iron. And this puzzled the team. They began looking for sources of iron and iron cooking pots and this and that and the other thing. 
And finally they found out. Ethiopians eat principally a grain called teff, which is very fine. It's like grass seed. And one of our smart people finally solved the riddle. This grass seed is thrash, in biblical fashion. A team of oxen walking around a pole in the center, or walking around a center anchored pole. And oxen are not notoriously uh, aware of sanitary practices. And this is the source of the high amount of iron in the Ethiopian diet, so nearly as we could, could discover. But what about this first business, this first fact about caries etiology, the fact that the primary cause of dental caries is bacterial action? What can we say about that on the basis of population findings? Well, here I must disappoint you. The emphasis over the past few years has been on findings of Streptococcus mutans. And you can find some quite inconclusive surveys. I'm thinking of one that was carried out in a suburb of Miami and Florida where all of one type of organism considered karyogenic, there are many strains of the so-called Streptococcus mutans group, were found in all of the children, another strain found in none of them, despite the fact that the two populations that had been selected for study were composed, one, of a group of youngsters with rampant dental caries in junior high school, opposed to two, another group which had no clinical sign of dental caries whatsoever. Similar studies in Colombia and down there we have a puzzle that so far as I know has not been resolved as yet. There is a town down there, Eliconia, which is five miles away from the control town and the fluoride study that's being run where the average decayed missing and filled count for boys age 12 is about four, as against in the town Eliconia, the, the uh, town that we can't explain, as against the control town where it runs about 12. In other words, about a three to one differential. But at any rate, uh, this, along with a number of other studies, has failed to elicit the difference because there are just about as many organisms considered karyogenic in the one group as in the other. On the other hand, there are studies which are consistent with the idea that Streptococcus mutans at least is an etiologic factor. A study by Littleton in uh, a continuing study group that we set up in Maryland was quite, quite consistent with the idea I've mentioned Harris Keene and his work at Great Lakes and his ability to recover strep mutans from the proximal surfaces and predict that dental caries eventually will ensue here. So I believe, and this is an opinion which is not necessarily true, of course, I believe that our problem up to now has been simply in the gadgetry and procedures that have been used in the attempts to harvest these organisms from the living mouth. The studies uh, that were done in Colombia were first done with uh, a pleasure of cotton, something like a Q-tip swabbed along the buccal area of the teeth. This material was put in a holding, holding medium and flown back to Bethesda. We know now that this is not the way to harvest Mutans. It is found principally in the interproximal spaces and in pits and fissures. And while opinion is against me, I still have personal doubts about the utility of putting these things in a holding medium, sending them home by jet, getting to plate them out four or five days after they've been recovered from the mouth. I think perhaps the most reliable evidence that we have 
on the effect of dental caries in the human mouth parallels that in experience with laboratory animals, namely that by, use, with, by using antibiotics we can do something really significant and severe to the occurrence of caries. The next slide was an early attempt. I'm sorry, let's go to the next slide. I should pay more attention to my outline against, I guess. This is an early study using bicillin, a penicillin preparation, and <clears throat> was carried out with children who were getting therapy for rheumatoid hearts, rheumatic fever, on a prophylactic basis against permanent heart damage. These youngsters received 250,000 units daily, and this dose, or its equivalent in animal terms, will absolutely inhibit caries in rats or hamsters. There will be no carious lesions in rats or hamsters who get a, a regime of this type. So the theory here was that any tooth erupting into the mouth of one of these youngsters after daily penicillin theory was instituted should be completely free of caries. And as you can see, these are DMF teeth and these DMF surfaces erupting after start of the therapy. There was still caries still on this crude basis I've discussed with you of demonstration of caries in dentin, despite the fact of an overwhelming oral dose of penicillin. Now you in the dental school here are probably aware of the studies that Dr. Loesch is carrying out using another antibiotic. So that I need not go into that in any great detail, his results are quite encouraging. But at this moment, I adduce this simply as po a population pattern in support of our general concept of Carey's etiology, namely bacterial origin. And perhaps to introduce the thought that perhaps we have bacteria involved in this process, which are fast penicillin, either by exposure to the antibiotic or because they were not of the type penicillin hits in the first place. I'm introducing the thought that the bacteria involved in dental caries on the basis of everything that we know at this point may be a heterogeneous microbiota. And this is something to keep in mind when you read of a study with an animal born germ-free, mono-infected with one single strain of Streptococcus, and I don't know how many there are at this time, certainly dozens, which is, uh, induces a type of caries which is then found responsive to some particular drug agent or some regime. You and I are not mono-infected. We weren't born germ-free. It'd be lovely if we could get a couple of uh, germ-free humans sometime, but I don't think their mothers would permit that either. So. Mama doesn't always survive, you know. So, until we can go through Cook's postulates, about all we can say on the basis of population studies is that this bacterial disease may be due to a wide spectrum of organisms, not all of which may be responsive to all of the same things. Many of us working with fluoride in the early days hypothesized from the way, from the phenomena that we elicited, that caries must be more than one simple disease. I think since that time, evidence to this thing has built up quite tremendously. Somebody is going to ask, in fact, that was the brunt or the thrust, I think, of the question we had the first hour. Well, what about the success of plaque control in inhibiting dental caries. Isn't that evidence enough in itself that caries is a bacterial entity? I'm not very well, very familiar with you people as a group. 
If I were more familiar and if I wanted to haze you a bit, I might ask you to go out and bring back reports of the clinical trials which show that caries has been inhibited by plaque control. I might, if I had happened to be in a very bad mood on a very bad day. The only thing even remotely resembling a clinical trial that I'm aware of that has gone through to fruition was actually carried out as an afterthought by Charles Clark down in Cleveland who tacked it on after the fact to a study which was actually designed to find out whether children could be taught by control and having been taught whether it would carry over past the period of instruction. And he did show, and you'll get into this I'm sure, that children can learn it, that they still have clean mouths some 8, 10, 12 months after the end of their peer group examinations and whatnot, which is all well and good. But I asked Charles if he'd take a look at dental caries, and nine months after the start of this thing, he did. And 21 months later, there was a difference of about 3 to 1 in favor of the youngsters who had carried this plaque control program through as against those who had gotten what was considered normal, ordinary, routine instruction on dental health in the classrooms. I can shoot holes in this. So can Charles. In fact, I had to beat him over the head to get him to release this much information purely because this was the only thing I knew of going on at the time, which was an objective appraisal or evaluation of plaque control as a caries inhibitor. Now, this too will date this lecture because I know, partly because I have thrown some weight around in other areas, of a number of other clinical trials now underway. This gives me reason to hope that there will be practical value, not just for that neurasthenic person who is willing to spend an hour a day working on his teeth. Practical value for children in plaque control. But for now, I would suggest that we withhold judgment until this sort of acid test thing comes through. Most of the other observations that can be justified as dependable population patterns in dental caries are also compatible with this business or this theory, I think it's more than that now, of bacterial origin. For example, the more remote the people, generally speaking, the less their experience with caries. And the next slide will illustrate at least one factor, or one aspect of this. We could speak of remoteness in time. Caries is a relatively late arrival on the scene. Almost all prehistoric skulls are relatively caries-free, except occasionally in pits and fissures, and there are times when these apparent lesions may be artifacts, times when the anthropologist himself will tell you that he is not certain this was a pathologic process or something that happened by leaching in the soils. But wherever we find present-day peoples who have a relatively low caries experience, they are almost invariably living in some remote place. Here are findings for 700-odd Alaska Eskimo commando type National Guardsmen. This sample of 700 odd men includes about one able bodied hunter type Alaskan Eskimo and five. It's a pretty fair sample of the whole population. And Group 1 men were men who lived in the big cities. Big cities. Anybody been to Nome? Well, if you have any idea of station wagons and suburban golf courses and whatnot, uh, drop it. Because the year-round population of Nome at the time we did this was about 1,800. 
Anchorage, Fairbanks, places like that, Sitka, are sometimes larger. But Group 1 and Group 2 men, and these were combined, by the way, in the report we gave you, had dental caries experience very similar to that which had been seen earlier in uh, white males in Baltimore of the same ages. Group 3 men were a little bit further out in the bush. And Group 4 men were from villages more than a normal day's travel from the nearest trading post. Now look at the differential here. An average of a little bit over two for the going rate, so to speak, par for the course was 14 decayed missing and filled permanent teeth. An array of men in Baltimore of the same ages would have shown us, in fact, did show us, about 14 disease teeth. We've seen this again and again. This was true in Vietnam, where there is a great central massif going down the center of the country, where you don't really know whether you're in Vietnam or Laos, where each village has a different set of ethics, there must be 20 or 30 different languages in there. And you find yourself in the position of speaking in English to someone who translates into Vietnamese, who speaks to a third person who translates the Vietnamese into the particular tongue used in that village. These were the people with the least caries and the most periodontal disease in Vietnam. Isolated places here and there throughout the world, the headwaters of the Amazon, there are tribes there where dental caries is certainly no more pronounced than this, which is consistent in my mind, and I'm giving you another opinion to accept or reject or as you wish, but I hope to be considered that perhaps these people simply have been up to now beyond the reach of this infection which, if you like to spin daydreams, can be traced with a little help from imagination and perhaps prevarication from some site in the Middle East and thence to the rest of the world. But there's another thing in this particular slide that I'd like to call your attention to. The young men, the 15 to 24 age group, even in this remote area, had about three and a half diseased teeth per person. Their fathers had only a little over one. Now, because of the cumulative nature of the DMF count, this can mean just one thing. Caries is increasing even in these remote populations in Alaska. And you won't be surprised to learn, first of all, that they're not all that remote. Secondly, that today their foodstuffs are not all that different from those which are had in places like Anchorage. And this is the pattern. Invariably, when we can make this kind of determination, in these areas on Earth where dental caries is relatively low, it's on the upswing. It seems to be at a plateau only in those areas like Scandinavia, the United States, Tahiti, some others, where we seem to have reached a saturation point. And this, I think, is something that should frighten you out of the soles of your shoes because you, as public health people, are going to be concerned with doing something effective, something effective. and I don't know what it's going to be. Now, what about this matter of a hereditary immunity? The next slide, perhaps, is pertinent to this. It doesn't show up very well, per more hopefully, perhaps, uh, better on the television screen. But here we have a picture of Indian natives in a rice field. And one of the ploys I've used in lectures here is to ask an audience that has traveled where this picture was taken. 
And if they have traveled, they normally will split somewhere between uh, Pakistan and the south of India, which, of course, is the answer I want. These are Hindus. And everybody knows that Hindus in the south of India have very little caries difficulties, and this is true. But these are not Hindus in India. These are Hindus in near Port of Spain, in Trinidad. These are second generation Hindus. And they will tell you that they're living exactly the way they lived in India once they came. The same clothing, the same customs, the same food, the same everything. But these people, so immune to caries, apparently at home, have caries experience in Trinidad just as high as that of anybody in the Western Hemisphere in one generation. We've seen this again and again. Mexicans were thought at one time to have and immunity to dental caries. Until some of them came to Chicago and began working in the candy factory. As dental director in South Dakota, I used to examine, examine Mexican beet farmers and their children out in the area north, just north of Mount Rushmore. In the course of some of our studies, we have examined the children of diplomats coming from Asia, now living in Washington, D.C., and I can tell you that these children show just as much difficulty with caries as anybody else. As far as that's concerned, I showed you Trinidad and an earlier array of data as one of the areas where caries is relatively high. Well, now, most of the citizens of Trinidad came, are Bantu originally came coming from an area in Africa which has been written up in the older literature as an area where there was a genetic immunity to caries. What I am trying to say is this. Invariably, when people, Poles, Mexicans, name them, who are thought to be immune to caries come into close contact with Western man, their carries experience very quickly comes up to the same level as that of Western men around them. Are you concerned with Trinidad or Poland? Perhaps not, but you certainly are concerned with the American Negro, the black in this country. And only a short time ago, there was a fixed opinion that black people were immune to dental caries. Well, studies made by Dr. Bagramian and others with a little help from friends like myself in Detroit and Carolina, have found Carrie's experience in black children exactly or very nearly equivalent to that of white children in the same schools. What does this mean to you? This is your baby. You, as public health people, are responsible for the health of all of the people. And if you still have your shoes on, it's only because you're calloused, I guess, or perhaps you don't realize what we're getting into here. But let's go on to this matter of dental caries and nutrition. Nutrition. Let's look at a few of the things we ran into in these overseas studies I've talked about. The next slide probably doesn't show at all. It's uh, a youngster that I found in the uh, waiting room of the outpatient clinic of the hospital in Ibadan one morning. The next slide, if it's visible at all, will show you the terrible wasting of this youngster who has been starved for calories, who probably has intestinal infections, and who probably has had measles. This is the sort of thing we saw almost anywhere we go. The next slide is a typical example of kwashiorkor, which is a proteid calorie malnutrition syndrome. And this child is not fat. This child is edematous. This skin is scaling out simply because that leg has swollen past the point the skin can take it. These children are quite apt to die. The next slide, pellagra, Egypt, this typical sign, this necklace sign. The next slide, Barry Berry in Vietnam. This woman's heart is literally bigger than a basketball at this point, 
And once she gets down to that stooping position, she cannot rise without help. I show you these just to say that we had the same opportunity here with this wide variety of deficiency states up against this wide variety that I've shown you in Carrie's experience to find out what went with what. What was associated with either high carries prevalence or low carries prevalence? A perfect idea, perfect thing. And that by and large, what we saw came to nothing. The next slide I'm going to pass over rather quickly because these are simply correlations, and let me say that they're meaningless, between DMF teeth at age 25 and deficiencies in the population of such things as serum vitamin A, ascorbic acid, thiamine, riboflavin. Now there's a fallacy here, and this is one of the dangers inherent in using a cumulative index like DMF teeth, because the counts of DMF teeth had accumulated throughout the entire lifetimes of these individuals. The nutrition studies, and these by the way are based on laboratory findings, really referred principally to what this person ate yesterday. In other words, the times do not coincide. The only reason I dare show you a thing like this is that we were dealing here with traditional dietaries, limited as a rule by simply by the food that was available and in some cases by religious or other customs. So a much better bit of evidence, I think, is the relationship between nutrition, as shown in growth and height and weight, in children who are at presently at the age in which dental caries is occurring. And the next slide is our finding for Vietnamese boys and girls for whom we had complete biochemical data. And here we have solid lines. The solid line here, boys who were caries free and girls who were caries free against those of the same age who showed some evidence of carious lesions. And we were just lucky in that this group split about 50-50. There's the difference between ill-fed and well-fed in terms that most nutritionists consider most important in the development of children. Now then, don't worry too much about this upswing at age 12. By this time, even in a low caries area like the uh, uplands of Vietnam, we were running out of caries-free children. There are only two individuals at each of those points. But nonetheless, that is so close to a random pattern that this and the next slide, which shows weight, that was height, are impossible to take apart. There was no relation whatsoever between nutrition and height or weight in these children which had any relationship at all to dental caries. And we knew a great deal more about that than these children than height and weight. This was true also for serum ascorbic acid, serum vitamin A, serum carotene, beta carotene, thiamine in urine, riboflavin in urine, and methyl nicotinamide, standing for niacin in urine, hemoglobin, hematocrit. And this in a group which, by and large, was adequate in its intake only in niacin and iron. That was barely on the acceptable point in protein, calcium, and was sadly deficient in vitamin A, thiamine, and riboflavin, and none of those things associated either. Now, what's become of our protective foods? This is something, an idea that dies hard in dentistry, and I hope you perhaps will do something to give it the coup de grace, because this too is one of the things that makes us seem ridiculous to the parents of small children who just know by experience that this thing doesn't work, and it doesn't work. Going back to the array of countries which I showed you earlier, I don't mean the uh, 20 to 24, I mean the groups taken from the literature. Dental caries is exactly highest in those nations that use the largest per capita amounts of dairy products. 
That's just a fact of life. With the exception of Tahiti, uh, the Scandinavian countries, Australia, New Zealand, parts of Western Europe, these are places where milk and butter are uh, most prized. So with the single exception then of the fluoride ion, which is now by official dictate considered to be an essential nutrient, there is nothing to say on behalf of nutrition as nutrition as a factor which might inhibit dental caries. Why do I stress the word nutrition? Because at this point, I am talking of nutrition the way nutritionists talk about nutrition, namely as the sum total of those nutrients which via the bloodstream reaches the living cells in your body. And I'm trying to make a clean distinction between nutrition, which nourishes this stuff in here, and diet, which is the sum total of which I take into my mouth. And they're not equivalent. They're roughly parallel, but they're not equivalent. We've even had to abandon the old definition of a vitamin as something that has to be ingested because it isn't manufactured in the human body. This was before somebody found out about the effects of sunlight on skin and so forth. Or I mentioned carotene a moment ago, which is a precursor, of course, of, uh, of vitamin A and has to be manufactured from carotene in our own little chemical laboratories. Now, when we switch the topic from nutrition to diet, we're now getting into an area where there is a tremendous pattern of association between that which we put in our mouths and our experience with dental caries. And the element which associates is sucrose. May I have the next slide, please? This was the result of our, and then perhaps, yeah, thank you. This was the result of the first eight countries that we worked in and these things that I've talked about. All we would have done had we continued it through the 18 or 20 more would be to get so many lines on top of lines that you wouldn't be able to pick out any of them. The pattern was the same. But here we have three countries which are pretty fairly representative of the experience here in this Western Hemisphere. Ecuador, Colombia, and uh, Chile. Here we have countries which are reasonably representative of the Far East. Thailand, um, well, I'm sorry, Ethiopia doesn't, isn't really Far East. In fact, its status as of the moment is somewhat in doubt, apparently with the Lion of Judah apparently ill and under restraints. But at any rate, here is Thailand, certain parts of South Vietnam, and Ethiopia. Here we have at this moment a single line representing Lebanon. That might have stood just as well for Syria, for Jordan, except that there's a great deal of fluoride in Jordan. And by the way, there's some fluoride in this Thailand thing. But generally speaking, this would be true also for, let's say, Greece, where we did not work, Egypt, where we did. And this utterly impossible line representing Alaska, but of course, I've given you the answer to that one. That graph in and of itself says, and it says no, can say nothing else but the prevalence of caries is increasing in this population. Well, now, what does this have to do with sugar? Let me be accurate. Let me read this to you. Sugar consumption in the Far East, these two lines, range from 6 to 16 kilograms per person per year. And that lower line, representing Ethiopia, is based on a population where half of the people had never used sugar in any form. Any kind of sugar, not just sucrose. Jams, jellies, so forth. In the Near East, 
average consumption comes more nearly to 19 kilograms. And in tropical South America, around 44 kilos. And in this country, about 44, although the last estimate I saw seemed to indicate that there, we were using rather more sugar now. So that, on the basis of international studies, there is a clear and definite association emphasized by this utterly impossible line here between the use of sucrose as a food, as a dietary constituent and dental caries. Now, association is not causation. But all of us who get out keep finding phenomena which seem to fall into this pattern. And the next slide is illustrative of a condition which has found many, many, many places on Earth, particularly, and this is perhaps muddying the water a bit, particularly in populations where nutrition is deficient. Remember, that's where we went to study. This little girl lives in Guatemala. Down there, it's called uh, generally the Coquea lesion because it has been found in Santa Maria Coquea originally. And this is a fault in calcification following the neonatal line. This has been called a number of things, and uh, the next slide will show what I think is the same essential thing. Here it's been called carie circulaire, where the teeth seem to be cut off right at the neonatal line. Well, now, this... And in most other places where this thing is seen, a characteristic of life is the use of sugar. And the next slide shows the market day at uh, Chichicastenango. You know what it means? The word? No, I don't. Chichicastenango is the equivalent of our English burg. And Chichicastenango translates the city of the poison ivy. I didn't see any either. But these bricks that you see here are not bricks at all. These are chunks of panela. They're supposed to weigh a kilo each, about 2.2 pounds. And this is the sort of thing that mothers stuff into the baby's mouth to keep it from crying, pacifiers. And then a, a very undisciplined observation, in my own case, I found this sort of thing in all of the children of a family either saw it or got the history of it, where Mama did this thing and usually didn't find it where Mama used some other kind of pacifier. Evidence? Mm -mm. But you keep tripping over this sort of thing as you'll go around with your eyes open to where it gets to be rather convincing. The next slide. Here is the same lesion. Now, this child is living in a town in Nigeria. One of the few towns where sugar was almost never used and where I didn't even see any beehives. Where calories actually were carbohydrate calories. 95% of the calories these youngsters got came from starches, carbohydrates. But sugar essentially was absent. And what we find there is this hard, glassy fault of calcification, which has not become curious. One of my uh, students uh, has done a study with people like this and trying to uh, determine why the posterior teeth don't show this same lesion. And what he found was that in children showing this lesion in the anterior teeth, there's four or five times as many carious teeth in the posterior as would be, as would be found in children living in the same villages who don't have this. Now, who has demonstrated that you can inhibit dental caries by withholding sugar from the population? If I really wanted to jump on you, I'd, I'd tell you to go out and bring back that clinical trial. You would probably come back with the VPOM study, which is a perfectly good study of showing 
that when you increase sugar intake in a population, caries goes up. But if you've read all 385 pages clear to the end, you will notice Gustafson's puzzlement that having done that and then withdrawing sugar, caries activity continued unabated. And this bothered him. So here's evidence that caries perhaps is exacerbated by sugar, but not that it, the process can be stopped by withdrawing it. Frequently quoted, the experience of children, especially in the Scandinavian countries during World War II, when sugar was rationed. These reports usually come to you in a sort of gee whiz uh, series of expressions without numeric data. And when you can find actual examination data, as Tolbert has given us, for example, I'm thinking of a population of 13-year-olds. You will be appalled, I think, to find that Carrie's experience in these 13-year-olds dropped only to the level that we found with 13-year-olds in Grand Rapids at the start of that study, a difference of about 27 percent and certainly nothing that would help you very much in your chair-side burden taking care of dental caries. <sighs> Philip J. many years ago sensed this lack. Practically all evaluations of the Michigan low carbohydrate regime, for example, were based on studies of lactobacillus counts. Phil wanted to go ahead and do just this clinical trial that I'm crying about here for its absence, and he was laughed out of court. You didn't need to do that. Nowadays we know better. But he was prevented from doing it simply because it cost money. Now this has led a few people to postulate that perhaps sugar itself is a prime etiologic agent in caries. There are population patterns occasionally occurring which seem to make that a difficult thing to postulate. For example, Easter Island, where Taylor, who studied the youngsters and dietary and adults there, noted that Carey's experience was at a very high level, and it was very high, despite the fact that sugar and candies were ordinarily not available on the island. When a ship came in, it might bring some sugar, it might bring some candy, but this was a rarity, like the sugar at Poli that uh, the Polish youngsters used to ice their cakes at New Year's and Christmas and no other time. Or we have to consider such outstanding variants as the island of Nauru, who was studied by a man named Cadell, an excellent observer. A place where sugar was introduced a generation ago, where it now makes up, or at the time of the observation, made up 25 percent of the total calories ingested. And yet on Nauru, Carrie's experience was and has remained low, despite the fact of the inclusion of sugar. But Nauru is another place which is rarely visited by men from either Australia or New Zealand. I think we must conclude that sucrose is an accessory agent, not the prime ideological agent. And I can only report to you, my friends who are working in this area, who do not believe we would solve the problem by substituting monosaccharide sugar, such as glucose. Perhaps at this point it's just as well to remember that the man who named Streptococcus mutans that, a man named Clark, working back in 1924, used glucose exclusively in his studies of Streptococcus mutans, and that strep mutans can in induce acids, that plaque is not composed altogether of dextrin, perhaps not even predominantly of dextrans, and that substitution of a monosugar might simply result in the kind of shift in the oral flora that we have seen 
as reactions to the use of DDT on insects or penicillin on some other bacteria. I'm reporting an opinion to you, an opinion held by men whom I respect, that this isn't the answer. So what are we going to do? I'm sure that all of you study much too hard to watch television on Saturday night or Sunday night. But there's a high camp program called uh, Hee Haw on it that weekend. It's old, horrible jokes, good country music. And one of the features is a quartet that sings a very sad song. And the refrain is, if it wasn't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. And that's the point that we seem to have reached here in our population studies of dental caries. But cheer up. The next time when Dr. Graves takes his restraints off, I'll talk to you about fluoride in dental caries, and the picture will be much brighter. So much for now. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu license.